With a rebel yell, go ow, 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 with a rebel yell. Hello everyone, this is CM Koseman again, and today's subject is rogue herpetologists. That's why I was singing this really bad version of that strange 80s song, Rebel Yell. Anyways, one of the things I like the best about this youtube podcasting business is that i can switch tracks any day any episode and i could be talking about history one day herpetology the other day the movie reviews another day and i think this is really fresh and it gives a kind of inexhaustible supply of interesting things to talk about and today i think you're gonna really like this issue if you don't know it already so this is about rogue herpetologists in australia you know australia is a land of reptiles it's got a huge diversity of unique lizards snakes and other reptiles that are found nowhere else on the planet and i've been there actually and it's really eye-catching like you go out for a walk at night and there's geckos every step and if you just take a little walk even in a suburban area you're gonna see some really unusual lizards or even snakes if you're lucky so it's no wonder how these animals have such a hold on the minds of australians and it's almost like a national pride kind of thing for example um There's a very active underworld of Australian reptile book and memorabilia collectors. They even have a Facebook page, which you can find in the links. And it's just collecting for the sake of collecting. And sometimes the page layouts, the typography and the colors of these books attract people more than the contents themselves so i can really see how this kind of contextual design and subject fetish can be an australian cultural thing you know little books with pictures of snakes that nobody else has seen the collector's the collector's appeal is almost certainly visible and it's almost palpable actually so with this many interesting reptiles and this kind of underground culture of book collection and so on and so forth it's little wonder how these two people have emerged i'm talking about richard wells and raymond hoser so these people let's talk about one by one but i think they represent a unique kind of Uh, semantic outlaw in the field of herpetology and almost like Ned Kelly this kind of weird outlaw thing is really visible in their lives so let's begin Richard Wells I first heard of this guy uh, when I was YouTubing randomly and there was this documentary Richard Wells Maverick Herpetologist so this guy is an expert field collector he goes out to the bush and catches all manner of lizards and snakes and his knowledge of the animals is really encyclopedic but when i was watching the documentary there was this one scene where you realize oh hello you are on cm kozaman podcasts again Yes, it's it's my friend calling. Dur, Naz, are you here? I am recording now, yes, but are you in Beşiktaş? Okay, okay, I'll, I'll be done by then. Tabi, tabi, hiç sorun değil. Haydi, haydi, ciao. Okay, scarcely a day goes by without this kind of 
pleasant interruption, but nevertheless, what were we talking about? So yeah, Richard Wells, maverick herpetologist. So there's this one scene where you can see he's really knowledgeable and he's like in the bush right outside Sydney or something. And he just tackles a huge goanna. But then you realize something is not quite right. Uh, because when he catches the goanna, he calls it Panthersaurus by the scientific name. But everybody knows that uh, scientific name for goannas is Varanus. And this guy is like saying, oh, there he goes, Panthersaurus or something like that. And you see, wait, there's something extraordinary about this guy. And then you see his home is full of books. But I'm not just saying a big bookshelf or something. It's like ceiling to floor full of piles of books. And it's not a healthy reading habit. And these books aren't necessarily about reptiles or anything. But you can see that later in the documentary, um, Richard Wells goes to a book wholesaler and just randomly buys like, I don't know, like state of New South Wales water management uh, tables or like some high school biology book. And he just buys crates and crates of books and he hoards them in his home. So you can see that he's a slight eccentric. And then the other herpetologists in Australia, they say, yeah, he's one of the most knowledgeable guys in the field, but his classification schemes are not widely ac accepted, to say the least. And he's like an odd character, but a pleasant guy. In Later on in the documentary, you can see he's embroiled in some other disputes about uh, land usage or whatever. He's helping this developer build a zoo of local reptiles and then the local people in wherever he is living protest him because he thinks he is just helping this developer kind of take over land and build buildings and basically his reptile show is a kind of excuse for this developer to move in and basically spoil the neighborhood and urban development construction and reptiles there's a 100 percent australian setting for you there but anyways uh, so richard wells is also a self-published publishing scientist and he has something called the australian biodiversity record which is an entirely self-published but a really professional looking journal and this book has this journal is just him classifying and reclassifying already known animals but i think it has a good dosage of healthy field observations too but once again you see this eccentric treat in it you see this eccentric trait in which this guy is basically making his own science and creating his own imprint of the wild, which is considerable. But he's like Don Quixote, you know, charging against the windmills. And uh, once again, it's not an accurate or a respectable publication. And maybe it's creating... A lot of confusion but there's the kind of Ned Kelly type uh, sympathy to the guy I mean he's just a unique individual and even though these people are hurting science a little I think it would be a far uh, less colorful world without people such as Richard Wells, the maverick herpetologist. Now, moving on to our second Australian renegade herpetologist is a slightly more controversial figure. He is none other than Raymond Hoser. Now, I first heard of Raymond Hoser 
when Darren Nash of the Tetrapod Zoology fame wrote an, a critique of his extremely active work, calling it the Raymond Hoser problem. And true, Raymond Hoser is like a supercharged version of uh, Richard Wells. And he was actually inspired by Wells, actually. And over the years, he has classified, reclassified, renamed, reassigned Australian reptiles, especially snakes, to such a degree that he risks contaminating, or they say, he risks contaminating the average layperson's knowledge of the subject. Now, I am actually not that critical of his work. I don't agree with it. I don't think it's real. But as I told before, people like Richard Wells or Raymond Hoser, they are like unique folk anti-hero types. And like them or not, any society is richer to have eccentrics like these guys than a society that doesn't have people running around in the bush and randomly renaming snakes and reptiles. So, but also uh, Raymond Hoser is much more than this. So previously he seems to have had many previous lives. He was a kind of whistleblower. He wrote many strange books like Taxi, Indecent Exposures and Taxi 2, More Indecent Exposures. And he worked as a cab driver, so he has seen and maybe done a lot of wild things. And I would really like to see what these books are like. So Mr. Raymond Hoser, in return of this YouTube endorsement, would you if you are listening, be so kind to mail me PDF copies of Taxi 1 and 2. That would be really nice. And should you do this, I will make a gratis illustration of a serpent of your choice. The deal is out on the offer right here. And also, Raymond Hoser was also a whistleblower and a kind of anti-smuggling activist so he's a kind of more active multi-dimensional guy than Richard Wells seems to be and he has other books like Victoria Police Corruption, Smuggled and Smuggled 2 so even though he's creating some sort of scientific semantic injury you can say that Raymond Hoser is a guy who has his heart in the right place. He now operates this website called Snake Busters. So this is his activity where he goes out to schools or anyone else who calls him, I guess, with his snakes and many reptiles. And he kind of makes a people's interact with animals kind of show so you can see some of his uh, pictures from his many websites so you could say that he's a kind of charming Aussie bloke who's kind of weird and quirky and he just has a soft spot for animals maybe but one of the other controversial things about Raymond Hoser is that he's a proponent of devenoming that's the surgical removal of poison glands from reptiles and he believes that once you devenom certain snakes you could just handle them interact with them and they would even make good pets and he has even gotten into legal trouble for this so i believe he was exhibiting his devenomed snakes which are forbidden by law to possess or bring near to people in Australia or something and he once got into some sort of legal dis misdemeanor over this 
But anyways, I mean, yeah, it's a controversial guy. But it's like a serpentine Ned Kelly once again. So he also, his main deal is the Australasian Journal of Herpetology. And you can see two covers from the many issues of this journal. And in these journals, he, much like Richard Wells, describes, redescribes, renames, and completely takes this uh, vagabond renaming to the level of a new art form to such a degree that the names of his redescribed genera read like things from an H.P. Lovecraft spell book. Moses El Fakhari Kukri Trioano Tiflops Katrina Hoser Serpenea You can see that at first glance these are very difficult names to pronounce but he's got his weird logic to them so Moses El Fakhari Kukri is some sort of snake Kukri is a kind of dagger used by Indian and Pakistani people so I guess this is to say that the snake is somewhat like a dagger and Moses El Fakhari is obviously the name of the person in fact Darren Nash says this too that many of these strange names are named after people Katrina Hoser Serpenea is either his wife or another family member and this is Raymond Hoser's replacement name for certain slug-eating snakes. These are like really blunt-headed, funny-looking, harmless snakes. So this is the name he has given them in his own publication. You see, there's a very human element here too. I mean, to name an animal after someone you love or your friend or your lover or your wife it's a very romantic gesture now I'm not going into the debate of whether these are valid names whether Holzer is doing the right thing or whatever but there's something to be really admired even in a tragic way of this one guy going around the bush renaming snakes into all manner of strange things like Sharon Hosiria, Adeline Hoser Serpinae, Charles Pearson Serpents. Also like there's this kind of nomenclatural uh, idiosyncrasies. For example, when you name a serpents is Latin for snake. So if you want to call a snake a tick snake. Tick, 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 tick. Man, she tick. Anyways, I just had to say this. But if you had to, if you discover a really tick boa or something and you name this tick snake, you would call it Packy Serpents. Packy being tick. So there. But you see, some of Hoser's name, names have this Serpenae which, to my best knowledge, isn't the right way to spell this thing in Latin. You either call it serpents, or I don't know, office, that's the Greek name, but serpenae? It's like, I, I don't know Latin much, but Adeline Hoser serpenae. Does it mean multiple snakes? Because maybe the A-E thing could be the plural. I don't know Latin. Someone who knows Latin, get in here and illuminate this strange mystery. But certainly, so let's go on reading these names. They, they sound very Lovecraftian. They have their even, I would argue that they have their subconscious poetry. You are Nedward Serpents. So it's again some after some Martin Wells Tiflops. I guess this is the blind snake 
named after Martin Wells, Nilsonemanus. Manus means hand, so it's somebody's hand. I don't know, but anyways, this and you see, I I think animals' names, especially the names of little-known animals like reptiles or dinosaurs, the names have a direct influence on the way we picture these animals. So, you see that this Ewan Edward serpents with this lots of E's and U's, that whatever this animal is, it brings to my mind a kind of swimming, uh, big, gracile kind of serpents. While... Another name, Swile Serpents. This is like a black, adder-like, rapid, whoosh, whoosh, stinging thing. Or Greg Wedocious. I don't know. But if someone told me this was a snake, without knowing, I would assume that it's a kind of green, neon green, very thin snake with big red eyes. Because the Greg Wed... That whole thing reminds me of tree frogs, whatever. But it turns out, if we read Darren Nash's commentary, that Greg Vedocious is actually a kind of garter snake. So, well, lots of fun you can have with these names. Luke Faba Serpents. This sounds very, like, somber, like, kind of knightly, very heavy-bodied not a boa or a python, but something like the Asclepian snake. Something saintly about it because of the name Luke, perhaps. So anyways, there you go. There's this kind of perverse magic of the names postulated by Mr. Hoser. This Luke Faba Serpents was actually a cat-eyed snake. So a kind of counterintuitive name there. But that's a good takeaway you could have a, from these things. Takeaway one, there's something really romantic about naming undiscovered animals after people or things we love. And I think this is the base human instinct operating with Hoser and Wells. That they want to be people who have seen things that no one else has seen. And they want to define reality in their own terms. So that's, I think, even if horribly inaccurate, something very admirable and very human. And I'll confess that, oops, I'll confess that I had moments like this. And I would go trekking. And in fact, in the Mediterranean Turkish province of Antalya there's some valleys and in these valleys you see these kotschi geckos these are like small stripy long-fingered lizards they're really cool but the ones I saw in those valleys yeah they're the same genus and species and whatever but they had these flatter heads and they looked in a way more tropical and exaggerated. They had these kind of eyelashes that the same species from other places in Turkey didn't seem to have. So in my mind says, yeah, this could be a new species and why well, wouldn't be cool because I would know exactly what I would name it. But yeah, I had some conversations with some local herpetologists and they said, look, populations move all the time. It could be a variety, yes, but this could probably interbreed with something else from elsewhere in the country. So it wouldn't really be a species. But, the, the professor said, uh, his name is Bayram Göçmen, a very uh, respectable Turkish herpetologist, by the way. So he suggested that if I could take a specimen and maybe do a DNA analysis of my own, Maybe this could uncover something special, but I didn't want to take any specimens. I didn't want to kill any animals 
for the sake of science or whatever. And I, at the end, I was just perfectly happy with these strange animals living there and I didn't have to give them my own name to appreciate them, for them to be worth something. But through that experience, I could see the operative magic behind the minds of Hoser and Wells and so on and so forth. But I mean, interesting, interesting life. Certainly, Raymond Hoser has had a very interesting life. I think a movie could be name, made about his biography. And there's my five cents on Australia, its unusual animals, and its unusual social identity, and the unusual things that people get to do there. Raymond Hoser and Mr. Richard Wells. If you're listening to this podcast, please let it be clear that I have extreme personal respect for you. And at the same time, I don't agree with your scientific findings. But I respect your knowledge of the bush and the reptiles, certainly. And... I think Australia is all the more luckier to have guys like you. Now, when the issue is that of scientific orthodoxy, there's a really bad desire to kind of mock the weirdos. It's like, ha ha, your things are wrong, you're wrong. But, I mean mistaken conclusions should be called out but this shouldn't be turned into a kind of name calling because eccentricities are one of the most valuable parts of the human experience and more often than not they are what drives science forth now the overall concern for people like Mr. Hoser is that they could contaminate the literature and mislead people. But I think this is a non-concern. Anyone with salt, anyone worth his or her salt, maybe they could get interested in herpetology because of these colorful and interesting characters. And then I'm certain that anyone worth their salt would be smart enough to figure that, yeah, you know, these guys, these guys aren't exactly right. They're kind of friendly cranks. But then, instead of misguiding people, they could work like a vaccine against bad signs and send people on long and fruitful careers of genuine interest and research in her pathology or other fields. So, there's my five cents about these two extraordinary rogue herpetologists, Richard Wells and Raymond Hoser. As always, keep your eccentricity alive. And with a rebel yell, goodbye,